production. I'm Jack Van Zant, and I'm here with uh, Alexander Sandy Gurr, the composer and emeritus professor of music at Cambridge University. And we're the co-authors of a book titled Composing a Life, Teachers, Mentors, and Models. And as by way of introducing our book to you, our audience, we I thought we would just discuss exactly what we mean by this title and what our readers can expect to find in this book. Um, like I said, we call it Composing a Life. And in many ways, this book is, is an autobiographical book where Sandy talks about how he learned to be a composer from his various teachers and mentors and how he put those lessons to work in his own music throughout his lifetime. From a relatively early age, I come from a musical family um, and I wasn't good enough to be a performer. Uh, I, you know, I played various instruments, but not very well. And comp composition seemed to be the thing that attracted me. And so I decided to do that. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, um, not entirely, as readers to the book will find out, uh, with the approval of my uh, parents, particularly. Um, but uh, I don't want this book. Uh, when you first proposed to me that we uh, attempt to do this, um, I was rather against it. And it was really the success of the Skype um, that somehow led, <laughs> led on, uh, in which I explained why I'm not someone who wishes uh, to have any biography or, for that matter, autobiography written about me. I don't want to, I'm sure there's a connection between life and art, uh, but I don't wish to stress it, and I don't know what it is. Um, not clear to me. And therefore, I wanted, when we set out to do this, I really set out to record my memories of my teachers. Um, and they've, that figures in the book. And I also wished um, to f include not my teachers, but my mentors, uh, which were people of varying types who had a strong influence and who possibly added something or subtracted something <laughs> um, from what I was doing or what I thought. And you'll find those in the book. And I should say one thing. It's necessarily that one's memory, especially if one's over 90, which I regret that I am, um, that one's memory plays false. And none of this is necessarily true. Um, it's just what I remember of the impression. And these were strong impressions, and they were almost all immediate impressions. I tend to be someone who forms a view of somebody else or a teacher or a mentor straight away. Um, other people surely are different. And um, those people uh, who I instantly related to, or who influenced me, um, remain with me, <clears throat> uh, along with a um, lot of other people who remain with me. Uh, but 
they're not mentioned. And it was you, really, who decided the form of the book, because originally I was only thinking about the teachers and mentors, but you added a number of, or persuaded me uh, with your very good questions and <laughs> generally authority over me, um, you, you um, persuaded me to go into the business of models, uh, which is something which is close to my way of thinking. And um, also various other things. I mean, Schoenberg was neither my teacher nor my mentor, um, but there is in fact a, a section on Schoenberg because in our family, he was a very strong influence. My father was a pupil of his and um, he was always a shadow although I've gone a long way away from it. Yeah, and I think that's a really important part of the book. Is I mean, one of the reasons uh, we made your father, your your memories of your father in terms of, you know, being a musician and uh, being around him and learning from him actually became the coda or the, la the final word in our book uh, because I think it kind of helps frame the entire, your entire experience as a, as a student of music in your life. Um, one thing I was gonna ask you maybe to just elaborate on is um, the difference between teachers and mentors, the kind of like formality and informality aspect of this, because I know in our relationship, we've had, I've had both of those with you. Um, and you discuss that in the books. Could you just like maybe address that a little bit say, about the difference between teachers and mentors? I'd like to say something about that. Uh, thank you for asking. Um, teaching, um, you, I was lucky with my teachers. Um, I can think of people who I might have studied with who wouldn't have been a positive influence on me. Um, but I was very lucky in all of them. And as I said before, the impression was almost instant. And I do believe that the relationship between a composer and a pupil and his teacher doesn't last very long um, because the pupil, a composition, a composition student, must be a personality in themselves. They must have views. They must have preferences or dislikes or prejudices come to that. And they are either respected or not respected by the teacher. And um, you have to, to some extent, surrender to a teacher. But once the, maybe in my case, the short period of direct teaching is veers off into a more general relationship, then it becomes that of a mentor. But then, of course, you can have a, also a mentor who is not a teacher. Yes. Uh, all the mentors I mentioned were not people who I claimed to have been a pupil of. And in fact, um, Olivier Messian once said to his class, which was called Philosophie de Musique in Paris, um, a pretentious title, but it didn't mean much. Um, and he said, anyone who says they were a pupil of mine um, uh, is a liar. 
uh, because I've never taught composition. Um, I think later on, one or two people uh, uh, were pupils, and he did teach them. But he somehow he was a teacher because we sat in a class around a table, um, and we sat there for 12 hours a week, which is extraordinary when you think about it, how, how one, pu one group of people for 12 hours a week. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, and the figure of Guno as it grew dark, um, appearing uh, through the lighted window um, in reflection um, at the conservatoire. Um, but the mentor thing was also in it, and that's what remains. Yeah, and I think, you know, part of my part of this book was to describe, from my point of view, um, uh, how it worked when I was both your pupil and your mentee, I guess you would call it. I think the lines between I think the lines are a little bit blurred with us because we were I was there with you as your assistant and so forth for a TA for a long time, and I think it. Whereas I I think when I first began to to with you you were very much a teacher it was more a little bit more formal and you were like uh, make you know looking at pieces and saying I should think about this or think about that but really pretty soon after that it became more of a I would say more of a, a, a guidance than anything. You would guide me to different places to look at this or read this book or, or you know, oh, you're interested in that. Well, you should, you should, you know, uh, look at this philosopher or this painter or whatever. And I think, you know, that's the more informal aspect of it. Was more social, like around the the dinner table kind of chat, you know. And I think, you know, that's pretty much um, was my experience and I and I think the part of this book that that I think is really important is like the that we show the way that you um, became a composer it's most of the book is about that and how you put those lessons to your life as a composer but also about how you pass that tradition on to me to the next generation and how I have done that to, to the follow the generation following mine and I think we're trying to make a point about how uh, musical DNA kind of operates through this kind of system like this stream of of the tradition which I think is important and that's why I think this book is important to because we're using your life um, um, as an example of how one does become a composer and operates as a composer through a lifetime um, now, I just want to, um, uh, our time is limited, but I, I wanted to, to, to ask you um, one more question, um, and maybe for our readers, is um, what do you hope our readers will take away from this book? Um, heaven knows whether they'll take anything away. <laughs> Um, I think they should take away uh, that a composer feels, on the one hand, uh, that they, he or she, have failed, and on the other hand, um, is trying to make a living, um, you know, like, like being a composer yeah. in a sort of public way. And there is a sort of, if you like, a contradiction, um, and at the same time, a complementary aspect to this. I mean, I feel especially at my advanced age, I'm aware of the limitations of what I have done. 
um, if I was already a fully fledged academic um, before I f remembered the, or found out that you had to breathe um, while composing. <laughs> and that when one does complicated things like uh, 12 tone same uh, Babbitt type things, um, one doesn't breathe. And uh, you have to breathe uh, in order to create musical phrases, um, because otherwise it doesn't speak uh, to anybody. And so I, I should say, although I'm on a Skype, that I have to breathe now in order to communicate something to this, answering your question to the potential hopeful reader of this compendium which you put together. Ah, well, thank, thank you for that. So, uh, well, thank you very much uh, to our audience, our Carcanet audience uh, on this YouTube channel. Uh, I'd just like to say uh, I'm Jack Van Zant, and I'm a composer and I'm with, here with my co-author and longtime teacher, mentor and friend, uh, Sandy Gurr. And our book is called Composing a Life, Teachers, Mentors and Models. And we thank you for your attention.